I think we're set. So uh, this is the uh, first of a two-part uh, session uh, for hands-on uh, threat modeling. So the way the way this works is uh, we're going to do a quick in-class exercise just so that you kind of get through the mechanics of how we do uh, threat modeling at uh, Sigital. Oh, yeah, sorry. Uh, so my name is Jim Del Grosso. Uh, principal consultant at Sigital. I run the architecture analysis practice, uh, which means I spend a good part of my day uh, looking at the designs of systems and looking for flaws in those systems. Uh, so my universe is about the opposite of bug hunting, penetration testing, and code review. It's on the other side of the fence. Um, we do the other types of work. It's just uh, it's not my thing. So I'm on the I'm on the design side. So what is what is threat modeling? Um, in a nutshell, threat modeling is a way to find flaws in systems. So if anybody was in uh, the Monday class when I talked about architecture analysis, uh, defects in software are split pretty much down the middle, 50-50, bugs and flaws. What we're going to do today is walk through a technique to help you find flaws. Where is this activity typically most valuable? Um, if you look at a typical um, SDLC across the bottom, there are security activities across the top. Threat modeling falls in these risk analysis phases. So in a perfect world, we would do the threat modeling or architecture analysis um, at the beginning of a project, of course. Uh, there are thousands or hundreds of thousands of applications already built. And threat modeling is still an incredibly useful exercise to do on an existing system if you've never done it before. Um, I suspect if you were to do uh, a threat model on an existing system that has never really looked for flaws, you'll probably find some. So it could be done later in the game, um, but obviously it's better to do it at the beginning. So what does the threat model process look like? Um, before we jump into the process itself, there really is very little standardization in the threat modeling world. Um, there's lots of uh, reuse of terms. Uh, we are unfortunately no better or worse than anybody else. We've got our own definition of words. So these are some of the words we're going to talk about today. Very quickly, <coughs> I'll just tell you what they are to us, what they mean to us. So an asset, <coughs> if you can imagine, it's, it's something that needs to be protected or a property of the system that needs to be protected. So availability is a property of the system. Uh, that could be deemed an asset as well as a piece of data, a piece of critical functionality, something that you want to protect. We have a security control, the thing that is protecting the asset. <clears throat> we have a threat agent. Threat agent is the attacker. It's code executing on behalf of the attacker. It's basically the, uh, the thing that's going to try to get to the asset. The attack surface, the part of your system that the threat agent is interacting with. How are they going to get into your system? That's the attack surface. Um, there's the threat itself, the thing that could go wrong. Um, likelihood and impact, um, <clears throat> these will mean different things to different organizations. Um, not probability, we have no idea what the probability of some attack is, but how difficult is it? That's the likelihood. So if it's a simple attack, likelihood is high. Of course, the mitigation. Uh, mitigation is all about risk management. <clears throat> Oftentimes, we'll look at a flaw in a system, we don't have to solve the whole problem completely. We need to mitigate it so that the risk is, is down to an acceptable level so that we can continue to move on. And in fact, we may have a multi-stage mitigation strategy, something that we're going to do short term and then something we'll do medium and long term to really fix the problem. Perfectly, perfectly normal. <coughs> and then we have uh, traceability measures. This is an idea, a way to collect the data that we're that we're basically you know, building for our threat model. And we'll actually build up a traceability matrix as part of the exercise. So <clears throat> the process itself is really pretty straightforward. <clears throat> it's not a lot of steps, <clears throat> um, but some of the steps are, are a little bit tricky to actually execute. So we start with a really important um, activity, which is defining the scope of the analysis. Oftentimes, systems interact with lots of other systems, and understanding the boundaries of your analysis is really important so you don't spend two years doing a threat model of a system and you're basically never done. So you have to really define the scope and the depth of, of how far you're going to do your analysis. You then have to figure out, you have to understand the system, right? Maybe this is not a system you built. If you're in a security group, and you're doing the threat model for a totally different system, you have to get smart about the system. So you have to gain an understanding of what's being modeled. Then we're going to uh, model the threat structure. 
So some of those words we talked about before, where you identify the asset, the security control, that's the actual modeling part. There's the interpretation of the threat model. The interpretation of the threat model is thinking through the threats. What, what could go wrong? And then the traceability matrix is a, is a mechanism for collecting that data. Again, we're going to do this as, as an exercise, so you'll kind of build up to this. So in our world, um, we do a lot of work with diagrams because um, <clears throat> we go into companies, uh, we do our analysis, and we want to leave an artifact behind to visualize where we saw potential problems. So there's two different ways to do, or two different types of, of models that we're going to talk about today. There's a system threat model. It's basically a, a threat model of an entire system. But the threat modeling activity does not just work on systems. You can also apply it to protocols, APIs, really any kind of environment. I have not seen any situation with the threat modeling techniques we're going to talk about today does not work. We've done this for embedded systems, mobile systems, of course, web systems, thick lines. It do doesn't matter. It is working consistently across any type of architecture. So if you look on the left, there's kind of visual clues as to what's going on. What do you, again, if you can remember back to the vocabulary that we had a little bit ago, what do you think the TA stands for? Anybody remember one of those words? Yeah, it's a threat agent. Very complicated. What do you think the little C's are? You should probably say SE from what I had on the previous slide, but <clears throat> it's a security control. That's our control. What do you think the little A's are? Are they assets? You can see where assets flow through the system. You can see where assets exist in the system. Are we going to put every single asset on a diagram? No, of course not. You're going to do things like build up equivalence classes of what's a group of assets. What are their characteristics? And you protect groups of assets. You have security controls that are protecting groups of assets. Um, but this is a way to visualize what's going on. You can see little zones. Uh, there's, there's zones that are built in. This is a really important um, part of the threat model because threat agents that are in different zones are going to have an easier time, their likelihood will be very different, to get to assets than others. A threat agent sitting out in the internet is not going to really have access to some of the things in your data center. But an internal threat is going to have lots of access. And so you'll figure out how much energy you want to put into protecting your assets from internal threats versus external threats. So we have a system threat model, we have a protocol threat model. Same icons, Different, different meaning for the protocol. So when we're talking about a protocol or an API, the assets are oftentimes the parameters, right? It's the data that's being handed across the wire to the other side. The threat agents are really a man in, it's basically, a, we're worried about man in the middles. So our threat agent is the client and the wire, right? That's where, the, that's where bad things can happen. And then we still have controls that are built in. And sometimes data becomes control. Sometimes there's something on the wire that's the control. So we'll see a little bit later. Um, well, actually, I take that back. Um, we're, we're not actually going to do the protocol threat model because there's, it's only three hours total. There's just not enough time. But it will. the same analysis that we're going to do for system threat model would work with protocols. It's the exact same techniques. All right, system threat models. Um, so the first part of the system was or first part of the analysis, sorry, is gaining an understanding of the system. We need to understand what the system is doing. In real life, for us, one of the big things is getting back to the business and understanding the business goals, business risks, so that we can actually tie a mitigation strategy that makes sense to the business. Having a really cool solution that the business doesn't care about is not going to go over real well. Right? You want to create a mitigation strategy that ties back to the business goals, business risks, and everybody's happy with it. So we kind of figure all that out with the understanding. As part of that understanding, we go through developer documentation. Again, I don't know what, what everyone here does, but in our experience, developer documentation runs the gamut from self-documenting code to really good documentations on internal wikis and whatnot. So absorbing that information about what the system does is, a, is another important step. And then you talk to members of different teams. Right, we're gaining an understanding of the system. It's great that some architect somewhere had their view of how the system was supposed to be built. Do you think every developer built the system exactly like the architect wanted? No, it doesn't work that way. So it's good to have the architect's view of the universe, and then it's really good to have the developer's view of the universe because they go that way. 
many, many times. So we do all this interview part. All right, so here is a, you know, what can be fit on, a, what we can fit on a slide is a description of a make-believe system. The kind of things, the kind of data you would get by interviewing, by talking to somebody. So I'll give you just a, you know, just a couple minutes to, to read this. But just read, read the, uh, the little description of the system. I'll read with you, so I can follow along. There's lots of good information that's, that's shown here just by talking to people. We know we've got Oracle database, so we have, a, we have a specific technology, we know we have databases that are involved. We know that we have membership only reports. We know that we have <coughs> membership only content, so we know there's gonna be some sort of an authorization model built into this system. Whatever that is, we don't know yet, but we know there's an authorization model. Um, we know a little bit about technologies. There's WebLogic with the J2EV being used, so again, we can Think about the types of, of potential risks that might involve WebLogic and J2EE uh, setups. We know we're making third-party REST service calls for user-specific context. How are we going to tell one user from another? We know we have HTTPS being used. Again, lots and lots of good information. We'll come back to this so you don't have to memorize this. Another typical artifact you get from dev shops are different types of models, different types of views of the world. So we have layer model, logical model, deployment model. So we'll just look at each of those in a little bit bigger view. So again, a typical layer model you might get from a dev shop. It's letting you know uh, what's sitting out on the client side, right? There's the user device, whatever the presentation layer may look like. There are various services that are sitting over on the server side. We're talking to other business partners or business relationships. We don't know how we're talking to them, but we know that they're different, <coughs> different components of the system. There's, we have shared services. Again, you would need to find out in the organization what that means. It could be shared services with you know, internal organizations. It could be shared services with external organizations. But we know we have some shared services, and we know we have a persistence layer. Again, we're seeing our Oracle databases again. Now we notice that there's, in fact, two. We know that there's another database called Form. We don't know what that's going to be used for. Nobody mentioned Form yet. <clears throat> and we know we're using Hadoop for something. We don't know what. But we get this. We basically get this, um, this layer model from the dev shop. We get the logical model as well. So again, we have our UI layer. Uh, we know we've got single sign-on solutions being used. Uh, we've got the payments part sitting out there. The payment actually feeds into four different pieces of functionality. We've got functionality for reports, functionality for admin. Uh, we know we make an external call to credit score. If you remember from the previous page, we had business partners with Experian and whatnot. Those are credit, credit rating companies. So we make external calls to credit scores. We see our databases again, getting a little bit more context that these two databases feed into Hadoop for some sort of analytics. So again, we're getting, we're getting information about the system by looking at developer artifacts. This is all about absorbing information about the system. So this is a logical model example. And then another very popular uh, way to get information about the system is the deployment model. Almost like a network diagram, but it helps us, it basically helps us understand how the system is carved up in real life. So we have our data center that's sitting out in the public. We have a protected area in the data center. Again, protected probably means that there's some sort of firewall between these two. A lot of this doesn't matter for application security, but it's good to understand where the boundaries are between different parts of the system so that when we're thinking about threat agents, we actually think about legitimate attacks that are going to happen from threat agents in different zones. So we're starting to understand how the system is deployed. And of course, we have different, um, we can see different zones here, and we'll see how that pops up in a, in a second. So far, everything at least reasonable. Any of these diagrams exist in your world? OK, good. We really didn't make them up. We, well, we made those up, but they're based on real life. So modeling the system, uh, basically modeling the system from the interviews, um, from the documentation, from everything, we're going to, un we basically need to imagine and, and create the model of the system, major components of functionality, not through a layer model, not through a logical model, not through a deployment model, but from an application security point of view, what are the components that are of interest for application security? Where are important assets flowing through the system 
so that I can understand where should controls be to protect different assets. <clears throat> so we've got control flow, we have component interconnections. We need to know where those components are in different zones. Again, we don't want to waste time thinking about crazy ninja attacks you know, from nation states. We want to prevent more reasonable attacks. Um, okay, you can use an existing model as a starting point. You can start from scratch. Um, you know, in our world, we generally start from scratch uh, because it turns out most of our clients don't have anything like the model that we're going to show. Um, it's just they don't draw things that way. So this is what a representation of that of that slide that had all the little lines describing the app might look like. So now we're starting to see a lot more information. So we have our UI. We have different components out in the, in the, out in the UI. There's some sort of a payments component out on the UI. There's some sort of a form component that talks to a form component on the server, which ultimately goes out to some bulletin board service. We can see that we have a payments <coughs> uh, component on the server, which is directly interfacing with the payments database, and will most likely go on to other, um, other external services. We have this connection to a business partner. Right? We're going to get the credit score to find out the credit worthiness of you before we accept your payments. Lots of information is now starting to show up on here, and the icons mean things. Um, when we do the lab, I'll give you a little you know, iconography of, of what these things mean. But if you had to guess, I think it's showing up in blue. There's blue versus white versus gray blue. What do you think the blue would mean, since there's a lot of them? Let's see how good our icons were. In scope, out of scope, ignore it. What do you think the blue means? In scope. In scope. Yeah. What do you think the white means? Um, what do you think the gray and the blue means? It's kind of tween. It's in between. There's something important going on there, but we're not going to look at that whole component. There's some functionality being provided from by some app server in the organization. So we need to be interested in most likely the data flowing into just this part, but not the whole app server. Does that make sense? There's parts of it that are in scope. There's parts of it that are not in scope. We have to control how much information we're looking at or we're going to go down a rabbit hole and spend way too much time doing analysis and not actually looking for results. So this is all about representation. Make sense? So it's, it's just been, it's a view of the system. Now this view, well, let me just get them all on the board. So different parts come from different, different sources of information. So the components are starting to come from the logical and layer models. The logical and layer models are giving us clues as to what components exist in our system. And they start to show up one for one in this diagram. We've got the machine boundaries coming from the deployment model. The deployment model is telling us where servers are deployed and what's running, what components are running on those servers. We know things are out of scope. The network zones come from the deployment model. Again, the network zones are useful. We'll see in a, in a second where they're, why they're useful. The protocols themselves come from the deployment model so that we know what protocols are being used on the component to the component interconnections. Another important piece of the puzzle. So the actual modeling of the threat structure, um, identifying the assets, identifying the controls, identifying the threat agents, thinking through the, the threats themselves. Again, assets, data functionality, properties of the system have to be protected. The controls, the things that are protecting the assets, the threat agents, it's, it's the misactor that's basically trying to harm the system. Code executing on behalf of somebody, somebody. Those are threat agents. We basically take all that and we combine one for one, how can every threat agent get to some asset? And we think through. We think through different types of attacks and, and try to figure out how can something bad happen and how do we prevent it from happening? So again, that's the whole point of the, that's the, whole point of the exercise. So back to that first slide that you only had a few minutes to read before, but we see it again. As you look through this description, what are the assets that are being kind of clued in to you just by this set of interview notes? What would be some assets here? Data or functionality? Let's skip properties for the moment. Data or functionality? Payment. Payment. So which, uh, the first one. Um, well, it is a payment application, but that doesn't, that doesn't tell you that it's an asset. It's not, 
So there will be, so number one, we don't even mention anything here that there's a credit card. So as you get this information, one of the other really important things that happens is you get questions that you don't have answers to and you have to go back and get the answer. This is a payment system. We haven't said how it's being paid. For all we know, you have credits in some make-believe account. It's a bunch of, you sign up for the system, you get a bunch of credits, and the payments are a reduction of, you know, credits. So you'd have to go find that out. But there's other assets that are, that are, so there's databases. There's, there's this concept of membership, which means that there's probably something that's being handed off to only members. Anytime we see member only reports, that's a report, that's data. Anything else? The content itself. The who? The content itself. What, what content? Uh, some content is free, another is membership only. Well, yeah, 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 yeah. So the membership only content becomes an asset. The free stuff, not so much, because the free stuff is not really protected, at least from what we understand. So we said database. We said membership only content. Uh, we talked about features. Well, actually, nobody actually mentioned features. I don't know. Maybe, maybe someone did, but I didn't hear. Um, so features, right? Functionality is a is an asset. You're going to need to make sure that somebody who's not a paid member can't get to premium content. So the membership only uh, capability is is an asset. And of course, third party REST service APIs. That's functionality. That's an asset. These then map to our com our component diagram. So we have our component diagram from before, and now we start to put these assets on the board. So we already talked about one through four, the credit partner API, we've got some payment info, there's other assets, right? We know it's a web application, so there's some sort of session management. So we have A06, which sits out on the browser and sits out on our app server, actually sits on all the app servers in this example. We have database access credentials. If you were communicating with a business partner, you may have credentials to that business partner. These, these are assets. Right? These are assets that you're going to want to track and understand who has access to them. So we build up our set of assets and we understand where they live. And it's important to put when those assets leave protected areas, right? Because as soon as they leave protected areas, they're at risk. And we have to protect that asset while it's in motion, while it's in rest. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. Back to the list. Same whatever, nine bullets, however many it is. Controls. Oh, back to the other one. Yeah, yeah. I have a question. Yeah. So you started out by defining what's in scope. Now let's let's say you have some kind of module that was initially out of scope, but you see a lot of assets are in there. You you take it in scope, but you just drop something else or well your 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 scope of your analysis is gonna be defined I mean, to be quite honest, it's going to be—it's going to depend on several factors. It's going to depend on how much time you have to do the analysis. I mean, the fact that you have assets being stored in 50 other subsystems doesn't mean you can do a thread analysis on 50 other subsystems. So, you know, your decision point of what's in and out of scope is based on time. It's based on is that really uh, a concern to me, or am I really only concerned that I'm giving them the data, or whatever, and they need to now protect it. And I need to let them know. And it becomes their problem. There's no standard answer. So I'd be, I would, it wouldn't be the blanket statement that because something has a lot of assets, it becomes in scope. Because that could get way out of hand. OK. Back to our uh, two, four, six, eight, eight bullets. What are some controls that are identified by our understanding of the system? HTTPS. So we have HTTPS. We have authentication. Thought I had a little clicker. I guess not. I don't know what happened to it. Anyway, I'm sorry. Authorization. Absolutely. Anything else? Authorization as in authentication. Probably not terribly useful. So we're going to have some sort of authentication. Who are you? I need some sort of authorization. Once I know who you are, what are you allowed to see inside of the system? Right, you're allowed to see member only, you're allowed to see just the free stuff. So we see that there are authentication, authorization, there's HTTPS. There's obviously others. Here is an asset for you. Okay, good, I'll see if that, I'll see if that works. Oh, excellent. Sorry. No, 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 it's, it's, it's the Mac trying to be nice. 
but I wish it would stop. There we go. It has stopped. <laughs> so we talked about authentication, uh, authorization, uh, HTTPS. Of course, single sign-on is going to be a control. Right? We're going to be interested in, in how that works. There's the authorization and authentication into the database. Uh, this ends up being potentially really important as to how there are different schemas carved up in the, in the data. Um, there have been a number of talks this week that have talked about things like least privilege. Um, you know, this is one thing that it just seems like a lot of organizations don't do. They set up a single set of credentials to databases and then because you're in the data center, nothing bad could ever happen. That's just not right. Lots of bad things happen inside of data centers. And having, you know, simple things like schemas control access to only parts of the database for different types of functionality makes a ton of sense, but it's almost never done. I, I don't really know why. Um, so we have um, what parts of the data we can get to. Of course, different databases. Do they share credentials? Are they different credentials? Risks start to change depending on the answers to those questions. Um, we maybe have some sort of a file system uh, access control if it's, you know, depending on how credentials are being stored. So different types of controls pop up just from, uh, again, looking through our understanding of the system. Is this so far making sense? Is it at least semi-believable? Okay. Oh, it works. All right. Uh, so we have our assets. We have our controls. We now want to think through threat agents, right? Those things that are trying to attack the assets. So um, there's a canonical set of threat agents, right? If I have a typical web application, what would be the, the standard set of threat agents that you should consider no matter what? In very, very broad terms. Any guesses? So there is a, a malicious client, but even more general, is that an authenticated or unauthenticated entity? Okay. Right. So we have an authenticated and an unauthenticated attacker on the outside, right? This is somebody out on the internet, some sitting at the cafe who hops on a network and is, you know, just attacking your system. And there's authenticated and unauthenticated internal systems. That's a canonical set of threat agents. You can start with that at a minimum. What do you think happens as you start to add more threat agents for your analysis? Does your workload go up or down? Your workload goes up. So is it nice to have 50 different threat agents? Sure. Will they be incredibly precise? Sure. Will you have a truckload of work to do? Sure. It's way too much work. So you've got to come up with some balance of how many threat agents you're actually going to consider. So we start with a base set of threat agents, and then we'll kind of figure out do we need more or less. And then we figure out, remember, if we go back to this model, a threat agent is going to have access to different parts of the system. So we want to associate the threat agent with the components that they can legitimately interact with because that's where they can really start to launch very specific attacks against different assets based on our, on our model. Anytime two threat agents are equal enough in capabilities, skills, then we use standard equivalence class you know, techniques and we basically blob them all into a single equivalence class. Right? We want to reduce the number of unique threat agents. Every time we add new threat agents, it's more work to do. <clears throat> and it, we don't typically Consider motivation of a threat agent. I have no idea what motivates these people. I, I, can, I could care less. I really just care what can they do. What can a threat agent do? Will this work? What's the likelihood that it can happen? Meaning, is it a difficult attack? Is it an easy attack? The probability of the attack? I have, no, I have no idea what the probability of an attack is. Can you just explain more what drives <clears throat> different uh, threat agents into the same equivalence class? Because, uh, I mean, the example you give, technically sophisticated hackers could be on the same equivalence class. Why, why do you, why would you say that? Well, they have, they're, they're an, an external, an external unauthenticated user, which would cover both the script kitty and the, the ninja hacker, the nation state. Um, they're, they're not necessarily the same threat agent, but the, the attacks that are only available to the ninja attacker, the nation state, are very specific. And in fact, in our world, we probably wouldn't even consider those as legitimate 
threats because you can't prevent a nation state from getting into your system anyway. So the, the, the uber skilled hacker is not our primary concern. Our primary concern, if we're trying to defend against a nation state that's a totally different animal, you will need different threat agents for that. But in general, we don't need to think about incredibly skilled attackers. We're, we're really curious about more general. The, the way that the equivalence class shows up more often is think about uh, maybe a DBA versus the uh, a DBA versus a sysadmin. Highly privileged users with access to your data center already. So what you have always for saying, internal, external, authenticate, authenticate. That's the place to start. And quite frankly, it doesn't deviate from that too often. Business partners kind of change the mix when they can, if they can get access into your universe, that's a different animal because that's not part of your internal control structure. But generally the four is a perfectly fine place to start and it doesn't go too far from that too often. Unless you're looking for very specific, again, we talked about attacks that tie back to business goals. Unless there's a tie back to an important business goal and you really need to think about a specific threat agent for a specific reason, the four are generally enough. Keeps your, keeps your analysis down, and especially if you're just starting with this, I would really encourage you to stick with the four because it'll, uh, it'll make it an easier, uh, an easier type of analysis. And then you can kind of gauge when do I need to have different threat agents. But four is typically enough. So for this, we're only, well, we're only considering software security. Is, is network security an important part of overall security? Yeah, of course it is, as is access to the data center, physical security, as is other types of security. But we're only talking, we're only interested in, in application security where network controls come into play is if we knew that there was, uh, I think the laser works, oh yeah. If we, if we know, like for example, we, it's, not, it's not displayed here, but how do you, what do you think this, this actually looks like at the network layer? What actually blocks access from the protected area of the data center to the restricted area of the data center at the network layer? Firewalls? Yeah, it's probably gonna be some sort of firewall. So we know that there's a different zone here and a threat over here, a threat agent over here is most likely not gonna have access to this or it's just at least not something that we're gonna be concerned about Initially, again, we got a time box. The analysis we're doing, so network layer controls. We don't. Imagine, for instance, on the left side, you have the artifact between HTTPS, HTTP, that also controls like DNS. Yeah. Considering their network protector makes sense. So we are interested in the control that is protecting the data flow from this to here. So if HTTP versus HTTPS versus TLS, yes, the protocol that's used for the communication between the two sides gets interesting. I thought you were asking about like the network layout inside of the uh, data center. Asking more about the capabilities of someone actually observing that network layout and actually just using the APIs was an investigation. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Well, we'll see that. Well, so we're going to see that right here because when we come to thinking about the threat agents, when we're worried about somebody viewing the, the traffic, that's our external internet-based attacker as well as our external client-side land-based attacker. If you're doing this analysis for a corporate and intranet app, um, you, you probably may have five because your, your internal LAN user is a, is a special case of an, of an internal unauthorized user, right? Full access to the corporate network, not supposed to be using this application. They're already on the corporate LAN. They can monitor traffic. They can maybe communicate directly to the backend system. So you have our uh, canonical set of, of attackers, uh, depending on the technology that you're using, if it's a cloud-based kind of a system, um, we may have to be concerned about who's administering the cloud. Is it, is it us? Is it a third party? What can they get to? Are we in a multi-tenant you know, situation? Are there other companies sharing data with us? Who's protecting the data? Who's at risk? A lot of that comes, uh, comes into play. And let me just put some of the threat agents and see if it addresses some of the concerns. So we have our external internet-based attacker. This is the person who's attacking anything on the wires. Right, so we're, who can get to or attempt to intercept any of the data that's flowing between any of your users and your data center? It's this, it's this thing, right, sitting out here in this internet zone. Is that, this is what you were talking about, right? Somebody, a threat agent that's actually attacking the wire, the communication channel between the outside world and the inside world. We have our 
TA-02, which is the land-based attacker. Again, way more capable than the guy sitting in some foreign country. Right? The person sitting in the foreign country does not have access to your land. Right? They're not authenticated onto your corporate network. But all your other users inside of your corporate network that are not supposed to be, that are not necessarily on the machine, more capable. Right? They have more access to things. And then, of course, there's the malicious user. So we got our malicious user. We got just somebody on the land, malicious or otherwise, right? just doing things. We got our uh, person sitting on the outside. Uh, this is you know, Joe Hacker. And then we have some malicious internal user. And this is where, again, depending on your level of depth of analysis, you may equi you know, equivalence class all the internal admins in one blob, but you may separate out DBAs versus sysadmins. I'm a bit confused about the corporate LAN. I thought it was uh, a social networking app with uh, free content and membership things and stuff like that. That makes me think about more consumer-like stuff, not like uh, corporate stuff. So, uh, it, it, I'd, have to, I'd have to go back and, and well, I'd, I'd have to go back and reread everything, but I, I think we want to just make sure that when you're thinking of an application, Whatever app is running inside of the user's machine, when you're on a corporate LAN, corporate users are basically a different type of threat for the user. Maybe for this social networking, it's not as believable. Uh, maybe it's a, yeah, it doesn't really make sense if it's a social thing inside of an org. That'd be kind of weird. An internal Facebook or something. So, but yeah, but just in general, think intranet apps, you know, you got this internal, you got this internal author, authorized user. So, Again, as we're starting to look at these different threat agents, they have different access to different things, and it's going to be easier for some. I was going to say, internal there are things like that. There's Yammer. Yammer is a corporate Yeah, I just the point was I don't know that we actually described that in the in the eight bullets. We probably could have said more clearly this is an internal social uh, a place to go. You know, what are we doing for Friday beer night or something? Hmm. So the difference between the one and two. For instance, here we have a package club, we have Wi Fi. Yep. So, as could be on Wi Fi, can we consider that as the agent two? Is it a fit agent one in any ways? Considering the user? Well, I mean, Wi Fi really doesn't have you know security that, that anybody can't break through. So sitting inside of a coffee shop, sitting inside of a, 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 a Wi-Fi network, I view that as different than inside the corporate network where you're your VPN and corporations take action, you know, take take precautions that not just I couldn't walk into most corporations with my laptop, plug it into a network port and, and get access to anything. Not typically. So yes, you're you happen to be on the same land, but we kind of view this as well, again, me, me personally, the way it shows up most times, it's, a, it's more of a corporate land where this really is a, a big difference. I don't view access to a Wi-Fi network much different than hitting the next pipe after the Wi-Fi network and intercepting traffic between your Wi-Fi router and an internet provider. It's, it's, yeah, it's sort of that, uh, if you say, some Russian hacker yeah. uh, sitting somewhere on the phone between your customer and the web server, yeah. It's different than so uh, and not so on hacker not being on that path. So I think there's a differentiation between someone externally that just can try a squadish or whatever on the app server, yeah. or someone really being on the path between your user and the server, isn't it? Well, it's you're you're on the network. Whether I'm on the network on the Wi-Fi, which is an open public network, or on the network between the faculty club and your internet service provider, to me is just not a significant enough difference to treat them differently. A corporate LAN is very different. When I'm on a corporate LAN, my machine has been verified on the corporate LAN to have the right to be there, even though I have no right to use the app. So that's very different than an internet user that is not going to be able to sniff traffic on a corporate LAN. I will ask my question then. Okay. Does threat agent one see all the traffic between your users and your server? Well, threat agent one is simply meant to be it's this it's the threat agent that is sitting out on any piece of the wire between your machine and your data center, wherever that may be. So this could be inside of an ISP, this could be inside of the coffee shop, this could be inside any one of the hundred network hops between your ISP. It's just somewhere in between that they 
They're just totally unauthenticated, but they can get the network traffic, however they do that, which is why we treat them all the same. It's an unauthenticated user that is sniffing network traffic somewhere. Where, and this is why we don't talk about probabilities, because what's the probability of this? Haven't got a clue. You basically treat them the same because of compromise, so to say. Is that, is that basically it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, you can go down the road of, of treating them different, but at the end of the day, the application security controls are probably not going to be any different. The reason why I was asking, because I thought that they wanted to see the traffic all the time, yeah. because you could also say, for instance, I want to do a denial of service, I don't have to be on that cloud. So you could imagine that the threat agent has less capabilities, he doesn't see any of the traffic coming by, it could still harm the application server. Well, for denial of service attacks, I mean, do I, I don't need to see any traffic going by. I just need to hit the server directly, right? So what? That's the differentiation between the capabilities of an attacker and now they're all part of one threat agent. That's not my confusion. Well, anybody, anybody here can, I mean, just because we can all launch the same attack doesn't mean they're the same. Anybody to the left of the data center can launch a denial of service attack against the data center. It doesn't matter what I classify you as. So it, just because we have a different threat agent mean, doesn't mean that only one type of attack makes sense for them. We can have a single type of attack that makes sense for lots of different threat agents. But these, this threat agent versus this threat agent are totally different. And this threat agent and this threat agent are different enough that it's worthwhile, we think, to pull them out separate. These guys are on the corporate LAN or some sort of an internal LAN, the actual user, the person sitting out on the wire. We, we can all launch the same attacks, or we can oftentimes launch similar attacks. Denial of service, one example. For me to launch you know, a SQL injection attack against the system, I've got to be authenticated, so I have to be an authenticated user. Anybody can launch a CSERF attack against an authenticated user, anybody of these, either one of those. So the fact that an attack works for multiple threat agents is not, is not important. I mean, it'll be, in, it'll be covered through the analysis as to who can launch these attacks, but it's not part of the differentiating of what is, how do we carve up the threat engines. Yeah? Okay. Oh, okay. So, the zones. Uh, so some new zones appeared. Uh, because we're thinking of different threat agents, we start to see uh, different zones. Oops, and that was the only thing that popped up out of that. So different zones that, that show up. All right, so uh, let's wrap this up kind of quick so we can get into the, the, the first lab. So there's, um, again, to the comment about how many threat agents you may have, uh, you may have specific threat agents uh, just because of what your application is or maybe because of what your business is. Um, when you have additional threat agents, they're going to just, they're going to create more work. You got to think about uh, new types of threats, maybe very specific controls uh, for those threat agents. And so this again, you have to balance how much time do you have in, in total to do the analysis, and you'll kind of again you'll you'll figure this out by experience. There's a reason this stuff is hard. Figuring out how deep the analysis should go is not a is not a simple thing. Oh, threat model. Yeah, just ran out of room. <laughs> so, the other thing to think about when you're doing uh, the analysis is uh, this, this idea of pivoting. That everybody know pivot? You launch an attack against something and then you're going to pivot off at that point to go get to other things. This is one of the classic ways you'll get into data center resources is you break into an application or a web server and then you launch the attack from there. So, you can also, whoops, sorry, wrong button. You can create um, additional threat agents if your analysis warrants. Again, I would not start with this, but if you start to do this uh, you know, more and more often and you get pretty efficient at this, you can create threat agents that are pivots to other things. So here we're talking about a compromised server inside the data center, and once you have that as a threat agent, you'll see in a, in a, in a second when we're thinking through attacks, one of the attacks is to get to here, and then the second attack starts from here and does something else. It's just a multi-stage attack. Lots of attacks work this way. But, but again, if you want to do that for every type of no. uh, host that you have in your data center, then no. it, it's impossible. Right. Uh, so then how do you define which ones to take, uh, to take into account and which you don't? Your business risk, what, the, what can happen. So if, for, hypothetically, if this were some critical piece of infrastructure and I had enough time, I would certainly not, again, I would not start with this. I would start with 
the canonical threats, if time permits or this thing is doing something so critical to the business, it may warrant analysis as a, as a pivot. What happens if somebody gets to here? You may put different kinds of controls. To how can I tell if this server is compromised? And you may have very specific controls, very expensive controls, but this way you don't have to protect everything equally. You may actually just have to spend the money to protect a couple of things. But it'll totally depend on your business and the, and the system that's being analyzed. So really, there's, there's no standard answer for that. But just, just know that that's a possibility. You can do this analysis and create a threat agent that is a pivot to something else. We're not going to do that today. I just really wanted to let you know that it's possible. So the interpreting. Um, the interpreting of the threat model is we've got threat agents identified, assets, controls, components. The interpreting of the model is it's, it's a gigantic for loop for each threat agent trying to get to some asset. Is there a control that's going to not allow that access to happen? And it's the thought process you're going to go through. And what are all the different types of attacks that could make sense for this threat agent to get to this asset? And we're going to think about what would it take for the threat agent to defeat the control that's there? Is the control weak? Is there a missing control? Is the control in the wrong place? These are all the, the types of uh, the questions that we're, we're going to ask. And then we record this data in, well, you can record it however you, you know, whatever makes sense for you. Um, one of the things that we do is we record it in what we call a traceability matrix. It's literally a spreadsheet, and we'll see that in a, we'll see that in a sec. But we want to record this information. Um, what threat is trying to get to what asset? Um, how? Interacting with what part of the, the system, the attack surface? And this is what will happen, and this is the control that's preventing it. So we'll see all that. So if we were just to, again, this is the, this is the system, and I don't think, so this is the system that we have. So we have all of the assets that we identified before, uh, the four canonical threat agents, a bunch of controls. As you're looking at the system, what would just be some natural types of, um, you know, attacks that you would, some threats that you would consider based on seeing the system, just, just like a handful. What are some things you immediately think about? Elevation of principle, like bypass the authorization. So yeah, we know that there is a member-only authorization control, C02, sitting uh, here, and that's the only spot. So sitting here, so I'm going to see about uh, doing some sort of privilege escalation. What else? Say so this again? So you're, you're trusting the user to fetch data for the external partner yeah. and then feed that into your system? And, and, and how are we getting that data? From HTTP? Yeah. So the both can actually. There's all kinds of, yeah, this stuff is wrong on purpose. So, so yes, you, would, you, would, you should be looking at this and ask all kinds of questions. Um, why? What is this information? Is this actually used for some sort of decision? I don't know. Uh, we'd have to find out. One of the things you'll discover is as you start to build this, no, no one brought up, but we didn't have enough time, but you, you see these little things and these little things, they didn't show up anywhere. Um, as you have questions like this, and I forgot the other question before about you know, how does something work, those are things that you go back to the dev architect, whoever, and you have to find out. I mean, how does the app server you know, communicate with the customer DB, and how do these two databases pipe stuff to Hadoop? No one, we didn't talk about it, no one gave us information about that, but it's in scope and it's of interest, so we would have to go figure that out. As you start to document your, your view of the system, you're going to get lots of interesting questions as to what's, what's next. This should be a what's next, right? How is this possible? What, is, what information is flowing here, and does it matter? But what else is very obvious from this picture that should not be? It has to do with controls. Any controls look like they're in a weird place? The authorization is he right? Is on the client side? That one. Yeah. Is that, is that even possible? 
seems highly unlikely that this is going to be not breakable by somebody. So we would want to go find out exactly what that means, right? What, what is this thing doing over on the client and how do you think that that control can possibly work? We can't, we can't dismiss it as it doesn't work, but we need to go find out why you think it works and exactly what it's doing. So that's, that's like a red flag, that's a red flag, red flags, red flags start to show up. And then of course, we know we have, it's a website, of course it's the laundry list of you know, web attacks that we're gonna think about. What are we doing to prevent you know, uh, all, all the X, X top N 10 attacks that are out there? Um, how, is, how is information you know, carved up between uh, you know, this? Is there, we see that there's two different app servers communicating with it, that they both have to have the same privilege access to the data. These are all kinds of questions that will come out as you're thinking through the potential places for things to go wrong. Kind of make sense? Okay. So we collect the threats in the traceability matrix, and it is a, you know, it's like a giant run-on sentence. How does a threat get to an asset um, interacting with this part of the attack surface um, with this goal in mind, and this is the, this is the control that's gonna prevent it. That's really what it is. And it's all about coming up with a mitigation that reduces the risk to an acceptable level. Right? Again, I've, I've probably said that five times, but it's really important to, to, to recognize that the problem doesn't have to be solved 100% all the time. Sometimes it's really hard to solve a problem 100%. It's, we need to get good enough. Good enough is gonna be dependent on your business. Right? We just need to get good enough. So that's the matrix. Again, I'm not, uh, it's just a giant run on sentence, like I said. Um, it, it really is, uh, for us, as simple as a spreadsheet. Uh, this is a document, if you're building software, um, this is actually something that you can build as you go, so it doesn't have to be a huge pain. And at the end, if you're looking at a system that's already built, it's a huge pain, because you build up a ton of rows, because there's a lot of stuff to think about. Um, but you're gonna you know, identify T01, is going after the session ID by launching, you know, session hijack attacks, and we're mitigating it through proper, you know, HTTPS and session management. I mean, again, you're going to put classes of attacks. You're not going to talk about every type of, you know, session attack because you really will have a, a million rows. But we'll talk about, you know, session attacks. You'll maybe refer to your internal standard that says we're going to follow internal standard, you know, foo, which describes how to do session management. And that's the, again, we're talking about design. If the design of the system is right, it doesn't mean it's implemented right. So just to be clear, and I, I said this on Monday, but I'll say it again, threat modeling does not remove the need for code review and pen testing. Because the design of the system is right, and it looks good, doesn't mean it's gonna be implemented right. We don't know anything about how the code is actually written. But when we have a, a design that says we are thinking about cross-site scripting and we're going to do output encoding the right way and we're going to do all these things correctly, the design is at least sound. You could implement it completely as backwards. So the design is right. But when we have a design that doesn't address output encoding, it's probably going to be vulnerable to cross-site scripting. When we have a design that does not address CSERF tokens and understanding how to prevent cross-site request forgery, you're probably going to be vulnerable to cross-site request forgery attacks. So we can kind of catch those early and make sure that you haven't thought about this, make sure you build into those controls to prevent those attacks. Make sense? Oh, ah, yeah, yeah, okay. Yes? Uh, when you went from uh, virtual press in mobile and we go into the visibility matrix, is there any kind of methodology you use to enumerate threats? How do you know that you're going to be enumerate them enough before going to actually say, well, these are the threats we actually need to engage in this? Because, of course, if you're an expert, you might say, I have a very good feeling of how many threats already are identified based on which you know. As a, a novice user, I, I don't know what, how we actually come up with that list of threats. So, well, you have your list, oops, sorry. Well, you have your list of threat agents that you've talked about, that you've thought about. You're going to be time boxed. You can't, it might take a year to fully populate a traceability matrix. You can't spend a year doing this. That's not realistic. So you're going to look at the threat agents and you're going to look at the assets and quite frankly, you will, you will prioritize what are the assets that are most critical? What are the threat agents that I'm most concerned about? Am I more worried about the external unauthorized user getting access to data? Then I'm going to probably go protect that. 
Am I worried that an authenticated user is going to accidentally get access to something? I'll probably make sure that I've got good controls on the back end so that should something go wrong, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll, figure, I'll figure out which. But this is going to be experience. Um, on the, whoever was here for the, for the Monday class, we talked about you know, architecture analysis is this notion of apprenticeship. This is why it's an apprenticeship. You, have to, you get good at this by doing a lot of it. You have to do a lot of these. And there isn't, there isn't any, oh, you should go look at this all the time. You should go look at this threat agent all the time. It totally depends. But probably you're also guided by the business risk, right? As, as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. So, I don't know, I think for me it would be easier if I got an idea on this business risk to prioritize my threats. No? Or and, and, and that might be. So different assets may be tied to different business goals and business risks. Uh, the most important business goal might be availability. So your biggest concern is going to be DOS attacks. It's going to be how do I make sure that the system is not going to be vulnerable to not only you know, network DOS attacks, but all the other DOS attacks that exist, you know, regex denial of service, XML parsing denial of service. So those class of attacks maybe go at the top of your list. So I'm going to think about all the DOS type of attacks. And let me go think of all the threat agents that are associated with the DOS style of attacks, and I'll do those first, if that's my most important thing. You have to prioritize. Again, you're going to be time boxed with this. But you're never done. Right? You're never going to be done with this. There How isn't any. Customer react to that, that you cannot give them an assurance that everything has been analyzed? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know that they actually know it, but we tell them that all the time. There's there isn't, there's, there's no such thing as, you know, completely analyzed. And just like when we're done, if we found uh, 25 things that were wrong with the system, it doesn't mean that there's not 26. There's 25 that we know of, and there are 26 is waiting in the wings. But, but do, you, do you actually get a time frame from the customer? Like say, you get five days to analyze. Well, so so you know, I, I work I work for a, a consulting company. So we, we yeah we get our, our time is is whatever the amount of money the client wants to spend to analyze the project. So just like when I'm assuming you know if you pay to get a pen test done, you pay for a week's worth of pen testing. Could the pen test last for another week? Of course. Would they find more things? Of course. When you get a week's worth of a pen test done, have they found all the web vulnerabilities? No, of course that's ridiculous. Of course they haven't. So it's a time bomb. There's just you have to spend your security dollars on different things. This is one of those things. What's the normal amount of time that we spend on, on uh, thread analysis for an application? Like this? So it totally depends on this. It depends on the type of architecture it is. Is it a embedded system? Is it a thick client? Uh, but the, the, the broad range is two to four weeks. But, you know, we don't know anything about systems, so there's a learning curve. If you were doing this internally, optimized. Um, if you were doing this over and over in an organization, optimized. So, you know, you'd be able to, again, I mean, realistically, it's going to be expanded because you're going to take time to get good at it. So it's, it's probably six of one, half does another for a little bit. But... It's a couple weeks, minimum. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, 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 so. What are we? One, two, or four. So these are sharing documents. So if you guys could share those. <coughs> 